The current guidelines suggest that you should have multiple meal moments throughout the day. Kind of the opposite started happening. You saw more and more research in intermittent fasting. Theoretically, from a protein distribution point of view, should be very suboptimal. But even under suboptimal conditions, you really didn't see a detrimental effect of protein distribution. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. Our guest today is Jorn Trommelen. Jorn is a PhD and assistant professor at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. Jorn and his his colleagues published a very popular and interesting study about protein. They basically challenged the idea that you need to eat only 30 grams of protein in one sitting to build muscle. Jorn's study showed that even 100 grams of protein gets absorbed and utilized for protein synthesis. In this episode, we're going to talk about this study and also everything else related to protein metabolism, protein foods, and resistance training. Jorn, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm uh, excited to have you on the podcast because uh, you and your colleagues published a few months ago like in the end of 2023 a pretty like groundbreaking or yeah like kind of remarkable study that refutes some of the previous findings in terms of uh protein synthesis and uh you know how many how many grams of protein you can ingest in one meal so yeah i'm like pretty interested uh, to talk with you about that study and everything else related to uh protein yeah that uh, was a fun one <laughs> yeah, we can maybe start with that. So uh, maybe we can cover the main findings of that study and uh, what are like some other, let's say, interesting nuances uh, that we need to clarify. So like for people who don't or haven't heard about it before, then pretty much the study was done that you had 25 grams of protein ingested after workout versus 100 grams of protein. And what you found was that the 100 grams of protein yielded a much longer and uh, greater anabolic, not anabolic response, but like the protein synthesis stayed elevated for longer. Yeah, that's, so that is the, the basic uh, setup of the study and the basic finding, but I'll, I'll quickly cover why we did the study in uh, the first place. So uh, in, in, for example, in sports nutrition, the current guidelines suggest that you should have multiple meal moments throughout the day. So it's the concept of protein distribution. Ideally, you have like four, maybe even five moments where you consume about 25 grams of protein. Um, because above that, it's thought that your efficiency, your use of the protein strongly declines and at some point even limits out it just has no additional value. At that point, you would oxidize, so burn all the amino acids in your protein, you simply cannot build it into your tissues anymore. Now, I was skeptical of that for various reasons. One was when you look at long-term studies where people got different protein uh, distribution, distribution patterns throughout the day, uh, you don't really see a clear benefit from it. Now, that can be for various reasons. And for a long time, I thought, once we have more of those studies, we can combine them in a meta-analysis, and then you'll see that protein distribution has a benefit. But kind of the opposite started happening. You, you saw more and more research in intermittent fasting slash time-restricted feeding, which should theoretically, from a protein distribution point of view, should be very suboptimal. But even under those suboptimal conditions, you really didn't see a detrimental effect of protein distribution. So then I started becoming more and more skeptical of that concept of protein distribution. Then mostly a fun fact, like not necessarily convincing on its own, but in nature, you have several animals who consume huge protein meals. Best example is a snake who can consume 25% of its body weight, which for guys like us would be the equivalent of eating about 50 steaks, 20 kilograms of steak. So I like steak, but nowhere near that amount. But when a snake consumes such a big meal, you, and some research has been done on this, they digest their meal for days and their protein synthesis stays elevated for days. So it's not completely out of the picture that maybe other species have the same principle. Because I kind of had like... Uh, yeah, some practical experience, let's call it that, where in the middle of the night, I once woke up at the pee and I just felt that I was still digesting my food. I kind of had like a meat burp. And I was like, well, I had a barbecue like eight hours ago. Uh, I just feel I'm still digesting this food. So that 
made me critical of those studies because those earlier studies, they just measured anabolism, muscle protein synthesis for like four, max six hours after a meal. But if I just feel I'm still digesting the food, if it's still in my gut, all that protein can't possibly have reached my muscle and be built into muscle tissue. So I got the basic idea. If you have a large amount of protein, of course, it takes more time to be digested. And after it's digested, it's absorbed. Then it's released in the circulation. Only then can it be taken up and built into tissues. So if you want to study larger doses, you simply have to measure longer. That's what we did. And only under those circumstances, then you see that these large doses indeed do have a benefit. Mm, yeah, it's kind of been my experience as well that uh, at least like having these less frequent meals and larger amounts of protein in those meals hasn't like made me not build muscle over the course of a long period of time. Like obviously I'm not like some sort of uh, bodybuilder or physique athlete, but uh, you know when I started doing it, I'm in the fasting about 10 years ago, I weighed like 67 kilograms or something. Uh, I was 18 then, and now I'm like, or the peak or the highest I've been was like 85 lean with abs. So like it's, and all the time I've uh, done some form of intermittent fasting, <laughs> whether that be like uh, the 16 and 8 method of fasting 16 hours and eating within eight hours and having two meals or even like one meal a day as well in some cases. And I've like never like not seen like a long-term plateau. Like once the training is there and you eat, total amount of protein a sufficient amount of total protein then at least from my own experience as well like it um, you know the progress is obviously slower maybe a little bit but uh, it's still like there everyone's always asking me what do i put into my protein shake i'll tell you exactly what it's 30 grams of whey protein 10 grams of collagen and one teaspoon of raw cacao i blend it up with water and ice cubes and it becomes incredibly creamy whey protein is the most bioavailable protein source in the world many studies have found that whey protein supplementation improves muscle growth and strength when combined with resistance training whey protein stimulates muscle protein synthesis 31 percent more than soy protein and 132 percent more than casein after resistance training Whey protein also promotes glutathione production, which is the body's main antioxidant that supports immunity. The brand of whey protein I use, Nordcode, has pure organic whey from grass-fed cows from the Alps. It's the highest quality and cleanest whey protein in the world. I combine it with a Nordcode complete collagen that has added glycine, which is beneficial for joints and skin health. Nordcode also has organic raw cacao with lion's mane and chaga extracts, which improves cardiovascular health and energy. All of this for only 250 calories, over 30 grams of protein to maximize protein synthesis and 10 grams of collagen for skin anti-aging benefits. If you're allergic to dairy, then Nordcoat also has plant-based protein powder made from pea, hemp seed and rice protein with added MCTs and maca. You can get a 10% discount by using the code SEAM10 at livehealthy.com forward slash collections forward slash Nordcoat. Yeah, so initially I thought protein distribution is probably not going to make all that much difference either way, but you know, there might be relatively small benefits, but uh, as more and more research comes out, including this study, uh, obviously, uh, I think if there's a benefit from, you know, following the guidelines, it's extremely minimal and it might really not be there at all. Mm. Yeah. And then it comes to like the practical standpoint, you know, <laughs> if you don't need to have four meals and you don't need to t carry the Tupperware with you or something, <laughs> then it kind of gives you a lot more freedom to just have, you know, two or three meals, the larger meals uh, per day. So what's, uh, what's interesting there is that uh, previously I've done several studies on pre-sleep uh, feeding and then uh, athletes were like, okay, pre-sleep feeding, I understand you want more protein, you want to distribute it better during the day, um, but there's still a long period between that pre-sleep feeding and breakfast the next morning, should I wake up in the middle of the night to again have a protein shake? <laughs> so that concept of protein distribution throughout the day and, you know, really have a have an alarm and eat every four hours in, in yeah, some bodybuilding circles, it's like really their, their religion, so to speak, and their dedication is impressive, but it seems like it's really not necessary. Mm. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to 
touch upon immediately is the one of the bigger criticism that your study got that um, you use the milk protein, which uh, is uh, much lower to digest than uh, whey protein. And uh, also like the the argument is that 25 grams of uh, milk protein or casein uh, that is in the milk protein, then that's not sufficient to maximize the protein synthesis response anyway. So just having more than 25 grams or like over 40 grams of milk protein would be already giving more, would be giving better results than 25 grams anyway. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I'm always happy when people are skeptical of studies that's what they should be um but at the same time it's always funny that uh no matter what you do people always say yeah but you should have done this uh of course we thought about which type of protein uh to use and we very intentionally used milk protein for a variety of reasons uh one is entirely method methodological and kind of boring but uh, we infused a lot of tracers in a cow, therefore we could make like special protein that allowed us to measure basically 50 things instead of just two things in the study. So we just had a lot more measurements, um, but that's entirely just a method methodological issue. Um, the second reason is that in the Western world, dairy protein has the biggest contribution to total protein intake. So I knew people were going to say, yeah, does this translate to other proteins? Um, well, the question is more, do other proteins translate to milk protein because this one has the biggest contribution? Um, nevertheless, let's answer that question. Does it, uh, translate to other proteins? Um, well, in practice, most people get their protein from whole food mixed meals. Uh, those are going to be relatively slowly digesting, uh, because of the caloric content of the meal, because of the fiber content. So the fact that we had milk protein, which is 20% whey protein, which is fast digestible, 80% casein, which is slowly digestible. So overall, milk is a relatively slowly digestible protein that better represents how people consume most of their food, namely slowly, uh, than if we would have done whey protein. Now, then the final question, would whey protein not simply be a more effective protein than casein, uh, which is something uh, our lab has done a lot of research uh, on, so I know uh, the literature pretty well. Uh, there's been exactly eight studies on that, that compared whey with casein, and uh, only two found a significantly higher stimulation of muscle protein synthesis with whey protein, while six found no significant difference. Um, so a lot of people have this idea that whey is much better than casein. It's not really supported with the literature. And in fact, I think people there kind of miss an important lesson from this study. A lot of those studies have measured muscle protein synthesis over a pretty short period as well, which means that the whey gut, which is fast digestible, had the chance to do its entire magic, so to speak, while the casein is usually still digesting at the end of the study. So it hasn't gotten enough time to do its magic. So I think if you measure longer, even in the studies where it now seems, those two studies where it seems that way is better, I think that difference would become even smaller. Um, but so just to summarize, uh, this is the protein biggest contribution uh, is pretty slow, which better reflects most normal meals, how we eat, and would be, way not be more effective, uh, minimally at best. Mm. Yeah, gotcha. So it's not as big of a problem as some people think it is that you use the casein, and it actually is more like applicable to the real world. Uh, yeah. in that if, sense, that if is... we would have just measured for four hours, I think the 100, 100 grams of whey would have beaten 100 grams of casein pretty badly. But every additional hour, the casein is starting to catch up because it needs its time to do its magic. So this whole concept yeah. of uh, you should measure long enough so you capture the entire response, that has simply been neglected in a lot of studies. It's been neglected in dose response studies uh, as well as in fast versus slow studies. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because like whey would increase the protein synthesis very fast, and but it comes down faster as well, whereas the casein will stay elevated for much longer. Yeah. 
and uh, but would it be like okay what is the situation where he's good to have this bigger spike uh, versus like a longer uh, time under the curve yep. so like good uh, good question are... so like now we're getting in the in the small little details that will add up to very little practical benefit but nevertheless it's interesting to discuss theoretically you want uh the faster digestible proteins throughout the day when you know you're going to have your next meal soon anyway because you have the big spike and the fact that then it's gone doesn't really matter because you'll have your next meal so theoretically you could argue you want a very large dose of whey and then four hours later another very large dose of whey four hours later again theoretically that could still still be better um, but even when we look at this study with pretty slow digesting protein like there's trying to go above this in terms of protein synthesis rates like it's already so high like it, you're you're in the range of incremental gains and then again you're back to the oh maybe protein distribution matters more if you have very fast digestible protein so one you would start living on protein shakes then you're back to the setting your uh uh timer every let's say four hours for probably a very small gain my guess would be even if that concept would work uh that time and effort there's probably other things you can do either in the gym or just relaxation think your time is better spent elsewhere mm -hmm. yeah for sure but um what what, what is like then let's for someone who is like really trying to like micromanage their muscle gains and the protein synthesis so like what is the research right now of like how many meals is maximum benefits uh like is it like the six eight meals like the bodybuilders do or for yeah like for the average person what is the maximum frequency in general that is the most beneficial yeah so pretty much the main takeaway from this study is uh eat whatever meal you have how big that should be determines on when your next meal is so if you know you're going to have your next meal in four hours 25 grams is not that bad could could you get a slightly higher spike yes that's what this study says okay so maybe you go a little bit higher you go 40 and then four hours later you have your next meal now if you know you won't have your next meal in say six to eight hours go higher if you know i won't eat for 12 hours you might want to go for 100 grams so that's that's the main lesson it's uh just your dose depends on your next meal now if you start with a blank slate where an athlete just says tell me what to do for optimal uh, uh muscle protein synthesis then again i could make an argument you still kind of want to have some protein distribution in your day in combination with fast digestible protein if you look and muscle metabolism entirely from uh, a protein slash amino acid angle but i don't think that's what you should do because as soon as you start eating other foods that would slow everything down anyway and of course you want tons of other foods you want the micronutrients you want other macronutrients so because of that your meals will always be slow because all those other nutrients will slow it down um, so this concept of frequent spikes of fast digestible protein is, is simply not practical. So mm. I would recommend people like their first goal is to hit their daily protein intake. If they, depending on their lifestyle, if they can distribute it, distribute it. Why not? You don't like, it's definitely not worse. If for uh, other reasons, maybe for convenience, you do time restricted feeding, maybe for some other potential health benefits, you do intermittent, intermittent fe uh, feeding. You don't have to freak out you'll lose gain uh, gains just make sure that that daily target is hit in that one window but mm -hmm. if, if a bodybuilder says no all i care about is optimizing my muscle mass gains i would still recommend the distribution just for the simple reason there's no potential negative benefit and like my study was not designed to say see one big meal is just as good as multiple all we know that the main argument for protein distribution uh, is simply not true that oh if you eat more than 20 grams you burn it all um so mm. the evidence supporting protein distribution very weak i would say 
But then again, uh, if your goal is to optimize things, why would you not try it? It's not that difficult. If you yeah. don't want to uh, do protein distribution, you're probably not missing out on much, if anything. Yeah. And, you know, like maybe like one massive meal probably isn't the most optimal for um, muscle maximum maximum muscle growth. So you, yeah, like at least two or two meals, maybe like a snack or something like that is probably still better than like one massive meal. Well, one massive meal is not necessarily a whole lot of fun. Uh, we did some <laughs> pilot studying, of course, to see how much protein you can eat in a meal. Uh, and then the second part is, especially if you're an athlete, one meal isn't necessarily a whole lot of fun. Like you still want to train and you don't want to really do it, or often you don't want to do it on an empty stomach, but you're also not going to train an hour after you just ate, let's say, 100 grams of protein. So at least... Two meals in practice, even if you do intermittent fasting, you probably still have kind of two meals at the beginning and end of your feeding window. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And what is the total amount of protein then per day that, based on the research, like is the maximum benefits and what is like the lower lower ceiling that you want to hit for uh, muscle growth? So that is still highly debated. Uh, if I ignore the muscle growth part for a second, uh, it's pretty clear that you don't need that much protein to not disappear. So we call that the protein requirement. Um, so the recommended daily allowance is 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, which is very little. And in fact, most like, let's say healthy young guys like us uh, naturally already eat more than that. Um, so without worrying uh, about your protein intake, most healthy young individuals eat enough to not lose any protein mass. Now, of course, that's probably not what your audience is interested in. Uh, they want to optimize health and our physical function. Now, a number that you often hear is 1.6 gram per kilogram per day based on uh, a meta-analysis that that uh, may optimize uh, muscle mass gains. I think that number is a good starting point to start thinking of what the optimal protein intake could be. But that meta-analysis on its own is not that convincing. If you just look at the pattern of the data, it's not that you see like, oh, clearly above that, there's no more benefits. Um, second of all, it's based on uh, self-reported intake, which is usually underreported in studies. So even if that analysis was spot on, it's probably higher than that simply based on the, the unreporting. So if someone, depending on how motivated and how much effort they're willing uh, to put into uh, optimizing everything, I would recommend, I would say up to two grams per kilogram uh, body mass per day. But again, I, I really see it as a spectrum. Uh, it's not like, oh, I eat 1.6, then this happens. Oh, I eat 1.2 this happens uh training will by far be the number one determinant whether or not you're gaining muscle mass and protein will slightly help you either way uh i'm obsessed with protein but it's unlikely that for most individuals protein is either causing you to plateau or you're breaking through your plateau uh training is just incredibly much more powerful Mm, yeah and your study actually also did it after a workout the the yeah. protein ingestion so yeah like how how yeah like you said the training is more important kind of even yeah so uh it's pretty clear that uh muscles like how much um so you consume protein it's digested in your gut then absorbed in the gut then released in the circulation from there taken up in in tissues like muscle tissues and then once it's taken up it still needs to be built into muscle tissue and that that last part is called muscle protein synthesis now if i give 20 grams of protein to a subject how much of that protein ends up into muscle tissue uh, any any clue let's say i just give a a, a random person pick someone from the street just has a normal life, doesn't go to the gym. I give him 20 grams of normal protein, let's say uh, whey protein. Any guess how much of that 20 grams ends up in muscle tissue? Is it less than a gram? Is it one gram? Is it half the protein? Is it 90%? Um, for a completely sedentary person, I would suggest maybe 
I don't know, 10%. <laughs> oh, that's, that's perfect. I, like if you, if you were faking your guess and you knew it, that was the exact, uh, that was the exact number. And then, okay. then one, you know it well, and two, you're a great actor. <laughs> no, it's, it's exactly that for a healthy young person. It seems to be about 10%. However, if you exercise, uh, it's about, it goes to 15 and potentially even more, uh, percent. So that's, well, it sounds like, oh, that's just a 5% difference, but that's 50% more than 10%, right? So right. either two grams goes in or three grams goes in. So that's a huge difference. And the reverse is also true. Um, for example, um, I'm pretty focused on sports nutrition. That's what I think is most fun. Um, but a lot of my colleagues try to investigate other muscle-related topics. For example, when someone uh, breaks a leg, has a cast, then they see that in a week, they lose like two kilograms of muscle from that leg, which is absurd. Like good luck training two kilogram in one muscle leg. Um, so they're trying to investigate how can we slow down muscle loss. Now, then an obvious thought is, well, you obviously can't train your broken leg. Can we supplement protein to slow down muscle loss? And it doesn't really work because there's, it's not like that muscle has low physical activity that you're walking around. No, it has no physical activity because it's in a cast. And as a result, the uh, your body or that specific muscle is no longer actively taking up the amino acids and building it into the muscle. So you really see the effectiveness of protein is dependent on your physical activity level. So it's not really a battle like which one is more important, exercise or amino acids because I could easily argue the opposite. You can train all you want. If you're not allowed to eat protein, you cannot grow because you cannot build tissues out of air. You need the building blocks. But the opposite is also true. If you're not allowed to move at all, your muscles just cannot build in those amino acids. That signal of physical activity determines how much of the ingested protein actually gets built in. Mm. Yeah. That's very true. Like, and even like bodybuilders, I've seen some studies where obviously they're training hard, but their protein intake is pretty small compared to like what is recommended. So I think it's like 0 0.7 and 0 0.8 grams per kilogram or something like that. And they still like maintain the muscle. <laughs> they obviously won't be able to like build a lot, but uh, it goes to show that like even for maintaining like the training stimulus is like by far the, like the biggest, uh, most powerful thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, we talked about distribution, we talked about, uh, amounts. So now let's stop, uh, talk about like the types of the protein. So, um, milk protein is obviously, like you said, very common in the diet. So what is the differences between, let's say we can, we can dissect them into like uh, different groups first we can talk about you know animal versus plant-based proteins and then maybe some of the details more of like okay meat versus cottage cheese or like milk protein and uh something like that yeah so in general um you can say that animal-based protein is more uh efficient than plant-based protein now why is that it's for a variety of reasons um, the easiest is to think of like, what is protein doing that's useful for the muscle? And it's kind of two things. It delivers the building blocks for muscle, specifically the essential amino acids. You have to get them from your diet. Um, and it's not just the building blocks, those essential amino acids, and in particular, leucine also acts as a signal. Um, so just as training kind of is a trigger for muscle protein synthesis, leucine uh, does that as well. Of course, that is nowhere near as strong as a resistance training uh, uh, bout. It's not like, ooh, I'm consuming a little bit of leucine and that replaces my training, but the underlying principle is the same. Now, when you think of it like that, um, you can kind of think of the quality of a protein depends on whether its amino acid composition is what the muscle needs for muscle growth. So that is the essential amino acid. Well, one, how much essential amino acids are in the protein. There you see that animal-based proteins in general 
have a higher percentage as essential amino acids than the plant-based protein. So that's one reason they're slightly more effective. Then leucine is one of the essentials. So that signal function also is a little bit higher. Then the third reason is that in general, animal-based proteins digest better. So it's nice that there's a certain composition of building blocks in your protein, but if they don't come into your body, it's useless. You just poop them out again. Technically, just to be technically correct, you don't poop them out. Your microbiota would use them, uh, but they're not coming into your body, to your muscles. So the combination of all those factors results that with, if you have an equal amount of plant and animal protein, there's just either a suboptimal spectrum of essential amino acids. So quick analogy, if you're trying to build a house and you have five windows and five doors and 20 million bricks, you can't build that many houses because you run out of doors, probably the first thing, even though you have enough bricks to build like a whole city. Uh, it's the same with protein synthesis. You need all the essential amino acids in a specific composition. And the composition is just often off with uh, plant-based protein. Mm. Now there, it is important to note that is mostly true when you eat like one protein source. If you eat like five different plant-based protein sources, then on average, that tends to average out. And uh, so that's called complementary proteins. Uh, the more different ones you eat, on average, the, the entire quality of the meal goes up. Um, then again, it really depends on the digestibility of the protein. Uh, of course, plant-based protein, it's not difficult to imagine, has a lot more fiber. Of course, fiber is super healthy. I'm absolutely not telling people to avoid it, um, but it does result in lower protein absorption, for example. Um, now, having all having said all that, this sounds like, oh no, being a vegetarian or a vegan, uh, you're never going to gain any muscle mass. Doesn't work like that. In the end, again, your goal is to deliver sufficient amounts of all the individual essential amino acids to your muscle. And with plant-based protein, you just have to eat a little bit more to compensate uh, for that. So it's absolutely possible to optimize muscle mass uh, and recovery as a vegan. Um, the easiest way is just to supplement with a little bit of uh, plant-based protein. One, that's the easiest way to have a high protein intake. Number two, because it's a powder, it's highly digestible. It doesn't have that issue of fiber. So mm. last thing I'll say about this is that um, uh, for every problem there is always in nutrition, there's usually a solution. And often people have like this agenda like, oh, animals are better or plants are better. And that's the way it is. No. When you look at this topic, yes, animals are more effective, but there's solutions to fix that if you want to be a plant, uh, uh, plant yeah. only uh, eater. Right. Yeah, like, like a quantity is a quality of its own. <laughs> I think it's a yeah. quote. Like, if you have sufficient amount of whatever of all the amino acids, then uh, it doesn't matter if they individually they're uh, lower quality because the quantity is what matters at the end. Like getting yeah, just sufficient amount of. The, yeah. And that's honestly that's the same principle as the study we just discussed. The bigger your uh, uh, your meal is, the longer you'll be digesting it. So the amount of protein compensates for the frequency because you'll be digesting it for longer. It's really the same principle that amount compensates for almost yeah. everything. Uh, we joke that we can retire now because we just show, doesn't matter what your goal is, just eat more protein and all the details like quality and uh, distribution then kind of become irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so like, yeah, because like casein is also like lower quality than whey in some sense I it's think. it's slightly lower but it's still relatively uh yeah. high it's pretty high in essential amino acids and it's digestibility so just to clarify digestibility is defined as how much of the protein will ultimately be absorbed that is pretty high for casein like close to 95 percent. it just needs very long so the speed of digestion doesn't really matter for that principle um with plant proteins, um, depending on uh, 
how usually the more processed plant proteins are, the higher quality they are. That's why protein powder, which is very processed, actually has a high quality from a protein metabolism point of view. Um, but with whole food plant nutrition, digestibility can be 60%. And you can see 60 and 95, that's a huge difference. So you have to eat a lot more of the plant protein to compensate for that. Mm, yeah. So, you know, pea protein concentrate or isolate or something like that, they're in some sense higher quality protein than even uh, whole foods, animal-based protein. Yeah, absolutely. Because, because they, but, uh, but it's, of course, important to say there that that's just looking from a um, protein metabolism point of view. Yeah. It ignores that the whole food will have a lot of micronutrients that are beneficial. So just want to make sure that people don't mix those two. Uh, I'm not saying yeah. that everyone should just eat protein powders. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it you know, can certainly help if you're struggling with reaching the total protein intake or if you are eating, let's yeah. say. So especially, the, the, especially vegans, for example, they are not <laughs> typically struggling with their micronutrients. So they are the group who can easily say, oh, my only challenge is, for example, protein intake. They can easily take multiple scoops of protein powder because they already hit their micronutrients. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like vegan bodybuilders probably are taking protein powder, but the regular vegans probably aren't. <laughs> yeah. So, so what I see a little bit is like, I think slowly there's more and more attention for uh, plant-based nutrition, which in general... I would say is not a bad movement for, you know, let's say general health uh, and sustainability. It's not as black and white that it's always better, but let's say it is, uh, in, it, it's a small move towards uh, the right direction, I think. But what I'm a little bit skeptical of is that if you know what you're doing with nutrition, you can be a very healthy vegan or vegetarian. But I don't like that a lot of vegans and vegetarians um, they try to convince other people to become vegan and vegetarian, but those people are not as passionate about nutrition. So they just blindly, okay, I'll stop eating meat. And then they start getting deficiency in, for example, protein, but also other nutrients. So let's say educated vegans, they are probably doing pretty well health wise. But if I would recommend, if I would tell my parents, you have to become vegan because mm -hmm. otherwise poor animals or poor environment or whatever, it would hurt their uh, health because they just won't have enough knowledge to compensate for the potential downfalls of a plant-based diet. So knowledge is mm. very important there. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're like, like a health optimizer or whatever, or a bodybuilder, then you're probably more like, yeah, aware of the pitfalls and uh, other, other things. <laughs> yeah. Um, one question I have is, so if you have, less protein but you add the amino acids separately would it make up for like a lower quantity of protein or um, do you still need like a total amount of protein so for example if you're you know eating only below what is like recommended for the total protein intake but you add extra amino acids into there are you still getting the same effect or do you still need to get the total amount of protein uh, as well no, so from, uh, again, from a protein metabolism point of view, uh, the amino acids on their own are just as good. And if anything, slightly better than protein, uh, why are they slightly better is because uh, they are by definition 100% digested. So digestibility is not an issue at all. So when you compare it to, say, milk protein, like 5% of the ingested protein simply will never be absorbed into your body. With free amino acids, they are pretty much always 100% absorbed. So technically, they're slightly more efficient than, uh, than even high-quality protein. So you can just count them towards your um, uh, protein intake. Of course, uh, when you take a free amino acid supplement, they have no other micronutrients. So... Am I recommending you should replace a very large proportion of your protein with uh, amino acid supplements? Probably not. But just looking at it from a protein metabolism point of view, you can absolutely do that. And theoretically, it could be slightly more efficient. Mm -hmm. Will that translate to any meaningful difference in performance or muscle mass? Probably not. But 
theoretically slightly more efficient gotcha yeah it might be might be like for those who struggle with eating the protein maybe more useful for them yeah so um coming back to my colleagues who for example do uh, research on intensive care uh that are pretty much people laying in a coma fighting for their life massive inflammation everywhere their gut is hardly moving because the body doesn't even know what's going on um, there they typically give essential amino acids because then digestion is much easier um mm -hmm. likewise yeah if someone what i often hear is that some people just struggle to eat first thing in the morning uh and there for example a free amino acid supplement could be a good way uh, because you just wash it away it doesn't feel heavy on the stomach because it just flies through it essentially mm. Gotcha. And I think, I'm not sure if you, I think I recalled in your study, you mentioned the caveat that it might not be a more optimal strategy for the elderly people, if I'm not mistaken, of having like, because the elderly are more vulnerable to like muscle breakdown and uh, it's harder for them to build uh, muscle tissue or stimulate protein synthesis. So is this kind of strategy of having just, you know, two large meals a day valid for the elderly as well, or is it more for like the younger individuals yeah so that would require speculation what we what we clearly know about elderly is when what we discussed earlier is how much protein ends up in muscle tissue for example that percentage is lower in elderly adults compared to younger adults so their muscle are just less efficient at using protein um, however there is some suggestion that uh for that reason elderly simply need more protein that uh, a higher amount of protein makes up for their lower uh, sensitivity you kind of come back to the same theme like if you have an issue increase protein amount uh, to compensate for it now, important uh, caveat that principle doesn't always work like oh just have more protein to overpower whatever issue you have uh, for example, um, we discussed the immobilization, so not using a muscle at all. That is one scenario where more protein simply is not effective. Your body just says, no movement, We're, I don't know what to do with this protein. Um, but in elderly, that's, it seems that there's at least good mechanistic evidence that um, more protein is beneficial. When you look at longer term data, it's kind of a mix. There's not that really convincing evidence that just more protein is helping older adults either maintain or build muscle mass. But when combined with exercise, there is pretty convincing evidence. So older adults who still you know, hit the gym maybe twice a week, um, their protein is pretty effective. Um, if you're not going to the gym, then, well, I don't think you have to worry about protein distribution because your protein is not going to do a whole lot anyway. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, like, I mean, the elderly will still experience the sarcopenia and frailty if they're not lifting weights. Yeah. No matter yeah. How much so, again, doing. physical, like, just as we say that with in, in young athletes, your training is determining, like, 90% of your gains, so to speak. Uh, but elderly it's the same like they don't have to go to the gym five times a week to maintain their body mass but just trying to have two reasonable workouts uh, a week is probably more important than their overall protein intake and ironically once you go to the gym like two times a week as an uh, older adult at that point protein intake starts becoming rewarding so it's really that synergy that you uh, want to see mm. yeah uh, one interesting, uh, I let's say, topic is also like carbohydrates, in my opinion, because uh, in some sense, like, or at least I th what I've seen is like insulin can also have very powerful effects on muscle growth. And uh, if you, because obviously people eat more than just protein, <laughs> they eat fats and carbs there. So like, does the carbohydrates and insulin have any like enhancing effects on the protein synthesis or any like other ways of affecting the the spike or the curve or something like that yeah so the, my uh, my first publication ever was about insulin so it's always a topic uh, that's near to my heart <laughs> um it's uh 
pretty clear that insulin um, in normal situations, and I'll expand on that in a second, does not stimulate uh, muscle protein synthesis. What is a uh, not normal situation? If you inject it at super high levels, like what I'm, like I'm not saying like double what someone's body has. I say like hundred times higher than what someone's body has. Then in one local muscle, like you, you can only if do it in a local muscle because you do it in your entire body. Your blood glucose drops and you die. Uh, then you can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. But effectively, you're starting to use it as a steroid. Um, if you just give people a little bit of insulin or you give them carbohydrates, um, there is no effect of insulin on muscle protein synthesis. However, there is uh, a quite clear effect of insulin on muscle protein breakdown. Now, that's a complicated <laughs> topic, um, but I'll give you the short version is if you have a little bit of an increase in insulin, you see about a 50%, so 5-0 reduction in protein breakdown. So that's huge, but you don't need that much insulin for it. And once you have that reduction, more insulin isn't helping. So you need a little bit of insulin and you instantly have the maximum effect. So in practice, it's not really something you have to focus on because 20 grams of protein alone, for example, would already give you enough insulin to maximally reduce um, that muscle protein breakdown. So if we make this practical, do you need carbohydrates for insulin as a signal? No, it would only impact muscle protein breakdown, but your protein alone gives that signal already. However, uh, does that mean I'm saying you don't have to eat carbs at all? Of course not. But that's through a different mechanism. It's not because of insulin, um, but basically your, your body is tracking whether you're starving or not. And you see that if I just, let's say you're my subject and I just give you a little bit of protein, boom, muscle protein synthesis goes up, no problem. However, after just five days of caloric restriction, you start seeing that your muscle protein synthesis is going down. And it seems that your body is pretty much realizing, okay, we're slowly starting to starve. Maybe investing in more tissue mass, this highly metabolic active tissue mass, that's not the priority for survival. That is a priority when you have enough calories and you're training super hard, then it's like, okay, how do I survive next week? Build more muscle mass. Um, but when you're starving, the priority is more like, okay, let's not starve even more let's not inv uh, invest our precious calories in building more tissue that will only require more calories so you absolutely need calories whether that's from fat or carbohydrates you don't need them in every single meal but if over a period of several days your body start noticing oh we're in a negative energy balance then muscle protein synthesis rates will go down but tomorrow if all you eat is protein uh, it will have zero impact on your muscle protein synthesis rate. You just can't keep doing that trick every single day. Mm, right. So it just uh, like regulates other hormones like IGF-1 and testosterone that also have this like abundant signal to the body that, hey, you... Yeah, you, so you... With, with calorie restriction, everything starts getting dysregulated. And uh, if you look at the hormone levels from bodybuilders who don't use steroids, they are... Uh, like their testosterone and everything is like super mm. low often right, they right. can't even get an erection just as a simple example right yeah so like having the abundance signal from carbs and insulin is like one small hack kind of that enables to like maintain higher hormones during like a calorie uh, restricted state uh essentially yeah yeah so i i don't see it as they, as maintaining a higher one it's just if you don't have them it will start dropping very very fast uh, but in in practice it will always it, like it will always drop if you are trying to sure. uh, lower your body fat um, but if you just go too low in them you're just accelerating that principle yeah mm. what do you think about these super super high protein diets like over two grams per kilogram, like 2.4, 2.5 grams 
uh, per kilogram, uh, usually used in like when people are trying to lose weight. So they're like just <laughs> reducing the carbs and reducing the fat and jacking up the protein and uh, eating like 50% protein almost. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of that. Like I've not really seen convincing evidence. Like above two grams is really, you're starting to get very high numbers. I'm, I'm as much as I love protein, I'm skeptical that that really matters. And I don't really see the benefit once you're at that two grams already, just give them a little bit of carbohydrate, like for the, mm. for the, uh, fat loss, it's mostly the calorie content that matters. Uh, and the evidence that like, there's clearly some evidence that protein is relatively, uh, satiety, uh, it like suppresses hunger, um, but that's not linear and oh, more protein, you suppress hunger much better than one gram of carbohydrate or an equal amount of calories. Um, so yeah, I have not seen, it's not my my expertise. I'm not reading every single study on that, but from what I've seen, I've not really seen convincing evidence that that's the best approach. And even if it was the best approach, it's probably better to do a slightly more moderate macronutrient profile so that the person just learns basic nutrition principles and rather think of it as this is a short-term diet where I do this extreme thing and then I can go back to normal. No, it's better to have yeah, teach them the basics of nutrition and otherwise they're going to think of carbohydrates and fat as enemies the rest of their life and that's not helpful either. Yeah, yeah. I guess the, the reason why people do it is that uh, the argument at least is that like a higher like a much higher protein intake in a calorie deficit is going to maintain more muscle. But like you already said, like the insulin or the small amount of carbs can also do the same effect almost. Yeah. And um, when, when you look at studies uh, with higher protein intakes, there's just no convincing evidence that anything above two grams is going to have. Uh, in fact, there's no real convincing evidence that anything above 1.6 gram per kilogram per day is having benefits. Although, as we discussed, I think that 1.6 grams in practice means you're eating two grams because people under report. Um, but higher than that, there's just no evidence to support that. Now, again, I'm, you know, you have to be pragmatic. If you're very scared about losing and you think it helps, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, um, but don't do it because, oh, it's definitely going to help. If, if you think it works, play around with it, no issue. Um, but yeah, it's not what the evidence shows. It's not what I expect. And you might set yourself up with just an unhealthy relationship with, oh, these macronutrients are enemies. And I don't know if that's best for long-term healthy eating. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, I agree. Like moderation, like learning to, not learning to suffer, but learning to practice moderation is much more important in some sense, because, you know, if you're trying to return to a normal way of eating and normal like lifestyle, then you need to have some moderation or ha have to have like the ability to practice uh, moderation rather than being like this on and off kind of like <laughs> eating disorder. So I would say I'm a pretty disciplined person in, in most areas of my life. But uh, if I eat an Oreo, I kind of want to eat the whole package. And I feel mm -hmm. that behavior uh, if you really told yourself like, no, carbohydrates are evil, only protein is good. And then you have some carbohydrate in some context. People are like, hey, I failed today. Today doesn't count. I'm going to eat all the carbohydrates and I try again tomorrow. And it just sets you up for this yeah, bad habits, I think. Yeah. Right. Um, one final thing I want to cover is from the exercise component. So well, like machines versus uh, free weights, are there any like better response from a protein synthesis uh, perspective when you're using the compound lifts versus like the machines? Yeah, so there's been a few studies, not specifically on muscle protein synthesis, but on muscle mass uh, gains. Uh, and those suggest no real difference between uh, machines versus uh, uh, free weights, which is kind of what I would uh, expect. Uh, in practice, I would say that people who use free weights gain 
a little bit better than people in the machines if I just look around in the gym. But I think that's mostly selection bias that if you're serious, you kind of want to learn the squat. You want to learn how to bench. You want to learn how to do a pull up. While machines, people who just want to play it safe and want to do some physical activity and definitely never want to get hurt. So I think it's more selection bias than mm. one is better than the other. So some yeah. advantages, at least theoretical, of uh, free weights is that it just better translate to daily movement. Um, uh, you use a little bit m maybe more like stabili uh, stabilizing functions. Um, the drawback is because there's more stabilization required, it's maybe a little bit uh, easier to not hit the same intensity because something else might give in. So it kind of has pros and cons. Um, but if you just care about muscle mass gains, at least the studies suggest there's no real difference. If there's a difference, it's probably minimal. But again, uh, I feel that if you go into the squat rack, you start knowing the other people in the squat rack who are on average pretty dedicated people and you just go... You know, you become part of the gym that lifts more serious. So I, I really think there is a benefit trying to do it in practice, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's just selection bias and the people you hang out with in a gym. If you just train in your home and you have machines versus, uh, say, a squat rack, I don't think it makes any meaningful difference. Yeah, it's like the person who goes to the gym for like the first time, or even like you know these not very regular gym goers they're not going to do the squat <laughs> more likely they're more likely to do the machines because it's kind of easier like lower barrier to entry and yeah safer but, perspective but another example is i've never seen anyone walk up to someone and say like ah good work on the leg extensions man good job bro and then they start talking about training stuff while in squats like oh it's a you know impressive squat how much are you lifting oh what training program so you kind of you see that the people who are in the weight uh, lifting section, let's call it that, uh, that is just a more serious group and you kind of become part of a more serious uh, um, lifting group, so to speak. Yeah. But it's not, I, I, that's entirely behavioral and not physiological that there would be differences mm -hmm. in muscle mass gains. Yeah. But it's funny, like, when you look at the absolute like pro bodybuilders, then most of them are using machines because they can directly target these specific uh, muscles. So it's like kind of a bell curve almost. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, then you also have, you have like, uh, let's call it, the I, I'm very passionate about protein. Some people are extremely passionate about optimal exercise execution. And then uh, like, all they do is analyze like which exercise, where is the optimal moment arm and uh, with cables, they try to, you know, have a set with the optimal uh, uh, torque in this angle and then a set with the optimal torque at peak contraction. Uh, so there's, you can make exercise science as complicated as you uh, want. Uh, the question is just how much of a difference is going to make studies suggest little to no uh, to nothing but if it's your passion by all means do it yeah for sure uh well yeah this has been very interesting and i think many people got a weight off their shoulder knowing that they don't have to eat four times a day <laughs> and they can yeah. eat larger meals uh but yeah it's been uh, great talking with you before i ask my last question uh, where can people learn more about you and your work um, well, on Twitter, people can find me with by my name, which I'm not going to say because they'll never remember it. Maybe it's in the title somewhere, but everywhere else I'm uh, at Nutrition Tactics. Uh, used to be very active. I kind of need to get back to it, but uh, so much things to do in science and uh, I'll uh, I'll try to pick it up again. So that's uh, at Nutrition Tactics. Awesome. Sounds like we'll put in the we'll put the links in the description. Um, but yeah, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Uh, I would say, I, I tell people that I believe that sleep is the most productive thing you can do. So 
I'm not saying you can never wake up two hour earlier because you have to study for an exam or because you want to hit the gym or whatever, because you don't want to mess up your training cycle. Like sometimes it's okay to sacrifice your sleep because it messes up something else. But I would say that in because then you care more about one specific area. But in general, that two hours of sleep would have been worth more. Like mm. your hormone levels would be a little bit better. Your mood would be a little bit better. Uh, if you just look into the sleep re research, like every aspect of your life becomes a little bit better. And because it has, impacts like every aspect of your life, uh, Commun yeah, altogether, that's just a bigger effect than what two hours in the gym or a healthy meal or fun watching Netflix. So uh, yeah, I truly believe that sleep is the most productive. It's not for lazy people. It's the most productive thing you can do. Mm. Yeah, and it's also very anabolic. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> or anti-catabolic. Anti well, uh, so there's... Uh, I'll, I'll, Keep it short, but there's like one of my favorite studies. I wish uh, I did it where people, there were people, same amount of calories on a university. Essentially, subjects were like locked up in the university. All the food was provided uh, to them. So the researchers knew exactly what they ate. It was not like, ooh, maybe it was something else. No, everything was controlled in the study. Uh, both, uh, both groups were put on a diet. Uh, the only difference was how much uh, the groups were allowed to sleep. And you saw that both groups lost the same amount of weight during the diet. Just one group lost mostly fat mass and very little lean mass. That was obviously the group that slept a lot. And the other group lost the same amount, but it was a much larger percentage lean mass and a lot less fat mass. And it was so well controlled. Really, the only possible explanation was the sleep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're just deliberately restricting the sleep, then you're making it much harder for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And most people, uh, they have what we call, uh, I think it's called something like sleep pro procrastination, because at the end of the day, you're at home, that feels the moment where you can do, no one is telling you to come to work or whatever. And that's the moment where you put on Netflix. But if you decide to go to bed and sleep an hour extra, every aspect of your life will be just like 2% more efficient the next day. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's been great. And uh, looking forward to maybe like follow-up studies on this uh, experiment. Uh, we're, uh, we're already um, thinking of them. Uh, <laughs> don't worry. It will take a long time, but they'll come. Awesome. Well, uh, it's been nice talking with you and I'll see you around. Thanks for having me. <laughs> But do you want to achieve and maintain biological youth? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to add healthy years to their life. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details.